All right, let's turn to two places. The bell's going to ring in about 30 minutes, so don't let that scare you during invitation. All right? We got about 30 minutes before that bell's going to ring, but don't let that bother you. God deals with you. You know, we can we can eat later. Amen. So look at Matthew chapter 12 and then look over in Genesis 22. I want to start out in Matthew chapter 12. And then Genesis 22 will be our main text tonight. Let's read this couple of verses here. Matthew chapter 12. Look, if you will, in verse 43. Matthew 12, 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Let's pray. Pastor, uh, Pastor Shribe, will you pray for us, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for all that we've received this week. We thank you for the preaching. We thank you for the conviction of the conviction of the Holy Spirit where we needed some very important areas. Thank you for the good spirit of Christian fellowship and uh, people who were bound by the same blood of Christ and did together because of the same Holy Ghost. Amen. We thank you that we can say I know that I'm saved or not. Amen. That big question mark over it. Lord we thank you for the assurance of salvation and thank you for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the enlightening of the Word of God by the Holy Spirit. I ask that you speak to us once again. Bless your preacher. We're grateful to have him. And uh, we trust that we've been as much a blessing to him as he has been to us this week. So, Thank you, Lord. Our minds are on Jesus. Amen. When we began this week, we made the suggestion the nice suggestion that possibly you've moved away from where you used to be with the Lord. And you quit listening to God, and then you opened up some windows and started listening to some other voices. And you know, the Bible says, the companion of fools shall be destroyed. It's not the fools that we're worried about this week. Amen? We're worried about those of you who may have some Delilahs in your life. And they are your companions. They are the ones who have the connection to Satan. They are the ones that you built windows instead of walls, so they've been coming in the windows to get you. And you've even grown attached to them. You like them. You love them. You enjoy their company, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Maybe you've identified Delilah and Ishmael. And you say, you know what? Get out. Get out of here, Ishmael. You're no good. You'll never be any good. I don't want you in my life. I don't feel sorry for you. I'm not going to support you. I'm not going to feed you. Get out. And you start building those walls and you don't want windows anymore because Satan can come through those windows. We like windows so we can see the world. So you can look out. And I mean, You're not going to go out there, but you like to look at it. You, know, you flip through the channels and you're just kind of hoping something will pop up. Uh, oh no, you ain't never done that. But there's the windows and God says you need to build some walls. So, hopefully God's been dealing with you and you've gotten a few bricks of prayer and a few bricks of the Holy Spirit and a few bricks of the Bible and a few bricks of good Christian friends and a few bricks of fellowship and you begin to brick that thing up. You got it all nice and clean. But there's a danger when we get everything nice and clean. Because we sometimes begin to turn into a hypocrite. Yeah. Yeah. Phariseeism. Yeah, You're better than those other Koreans up there on the hill. Because they're charismatics. You're better than those people that use an NIV. You're better than them. 
You say, what's that? That's the voice of the devil. The danger we have in our movement, in our camp, is because we are right on certain things and we have to name heresy. I'm all for that. I'll call them out just like you will. But what will happen to you, especially young Christians, you think, I'm somebody because I'm a King James Bible believer. You can live for the devil and be a King James Bible believer. You can have Ishmael in your life and be a King James Bible believer. The Ishmael of pride. The Ishmael of a garnished, clean house. And you can have more wicked spirit in your life than these people that have the bad music. They don't know any better. The first response we have when we see this stuff is to laugh, but it should be to weep. Oh, come on. The old preacher J. Vernon McGee, I think he made the statement, we should never enjoy telling someone they go to hell. They're going to hell. That's good. If you have a little bit, you're going you're gonna to fry like a piece of bacon in hell. There's something wrong with you. Who do you think you are? Oh, I know who you are. You've cleaned out the house. You've bricked up the wall. You're so separated. Ishmael's not in your life, but all these other wicked spirits are. And you will not consider for a minute that you could be wrong about anything. That's right. Absolutely. You say, well, I got the King James Bible right. Yeah, but everything else is not right. The attitude and the hypocrisy and the Phariseeism is not right. We have to gauge that in our lives before we can get to Isaac where we can sacrifice. Now, Genesis 22 here. We have discipline, and I really marvel at your discipline. Man, I watched some of you climb up that uh, obstacle thing like you were a Spider-Man or something. Just <laughs> dong, 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 dong. Take a little break. <laughs> dong, 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 dong. I couldn't believe that. It was hurting me just watching you go up that thing. You have the discipline. You have, you read, you study, you're very academic. You take notes. You remember more points of the message than I do. I'll forget tomorrow what I preach today. I have to call you and say, hey, can I get some points here for this message? Discipline. Duty. But what about devotion? You have diligence too. But what about devotion? This is where we get here in Genesis 22, verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Devotion is only seen by the Lord through Sacrifice. Devotion is seen. And remember, you don't sacrifice Ishmael. Ishmael is the flesh. Ishmael is sin. Ishmael is the unclean animal. You don't sacrifice Ishmael. You sacrifice Isaac. You sacrifice that thing in your life that you love the most. You let go and let God have it. This is what God told him. This is a command, number one. A command, not a choice. Verse number two. Abraham arrives at this level. I believe we came to camp because we want to go to a deeper level in our Christian life, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, you can do something a million times wrong. You say, I have experience. No, you've done one thing a million times the same way. You're still in ankle water doing the same thing. Ezekiel's out there and God says, you move a little further where it's to the knees. Okay? And he says, all right, Ezekiel, you come out a little bit further where it's up to the waist. And he's like, oh, you know, I can feel the current a little bit now. And he says, okay, Zeke, come out a little bit further. And he gets out a little bit further and he loses control. And he has to go where the current takes him. You see, it's okay for us to be Bible believers, to love Jesus as long as it's ankle deep water. Because we're still in control of our life. Oh, we can say we're spiritual... But the only reason that you're saying that you're spiritual is because that's what everybody else is saying. You see, we've got to get to the place where we can understand that sacrifice is the next level. 
It's beyond just do's and don'ts. It's God says, I gave my life for you. What are you willing to give for me? It's a command, not a choice. Notice this is serious. This is serious. This is serious. This is strenuous. Salvation is easy, thank God. Amen. You simply believe Amen. the ABCs of salvation. Admit, uh, believe, confess. Yeah. It's simple. It's easy. Salvation is what God does for a sinner who can't justify himself. Sanctification and sacrifice is a whole other thing. This is the level of sacrifice where it's not an easy thing. And then it has to do with selflessness. Here you are and you value your self-esteem and yourself by what? By how good you perform among your peers? Did you climb the rock wall today because everybody else did? Us Japhethites, as the pastor was saying, we're different in some respects. We're a little more individualistic in some areas. Um, I don't feel like doing something. I'm probably not going to do it. You say everybody else is doing it. Well... I don't want to get hurt. <laughs> but see what happens oftentimes, there's peer pressure, even if it's positive peer pressure. What happens is the habits that develop that are supposedly spiritual are really just pressure because your self esteem is built on pleasing everybody else instead of Jesus Christ. And that includes family. That includes church family. Well, so-and-so thinks I should go to Bible school. What does God think? So-and-so thinks I should go get higher education, a master's degree. What does God say about it? What happens to a lot of people is they bow down to the holy grail of their ancestors instead of sacrificing for Jesus. Now you have to follow the boundaries of your parents. I'm not teaching you to rebel against your parents. But you reach a certain age and God says, come here. You're like, hey, come on mom and dad. Hey, up. No, God says, no, you. Me and you. When you get saved, you know what? It's God and you. It's a personal relationship. We want to develop our relationship with everybody all together. God says, me and you. Good. What if God says, I want you to work at McDonald's for the rest of your life? Come on. Woo! Come on. Mm. You're not willing to sacrifice that. Yes. You're going to stay in your room, cleaned out, with nobody but wicked spirits in there. And you're going to call the you're going to attack the NIV people all the time so you can build yourself up. Because you're not willing to sacrifice your Isaac. I wish I could be a little kinder, but we have to go the way the Lord wants us to go. Romans 12, 1 and 2, you know the passage. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect, uh, acceptable and perfect will of God. So what are we talking about? Sacrifice. What are we talking about as well? We're talking about success in the Christian life. Same thing. Your success based on your Christian life is based on your obedience to Him whether or not you're willing to lay down your Isaac, whatever your Isaac may be. But we make it all these other things that people have invented. We try to be conformed. To conform something is like if, if I was to um, get several pieces of paper and cut them and paste them together and tape them together and make something from the outside. Conform it together from the outside. To be transformed is God doing something from the inside. Amen. We want to conform on the outside. God wants to do something on the inside. Expectations lead to disappointments. A false success can lead to carnal pride. Even false spirituality. 
and you set these expectations based on the world, we can really kick you and make fun of you. But when you set your expectation based on other Bible believers, we think that's okay. No, it's not. Your expectations should come from Jesus. You should be willing to sacrifice to Jesus. Every one of us shall give account of himself to who? God. To who? God. Don't forget that. Don't let success go to your head or failure go to your heart. I want to say this because I know how driven you are. I'm just, I stand amazed because a lot of our kids, they need a little bit of what you have. Some of that discipline, some of that fortitude, some of that character, that integrity. Our kids are just, whatever, whichever way the wind blows, they're falling this way and falling that way. But I'll say this, I want to encourage you in this because what happens is you get so driven and you see these others and you're like, oh, I need to be as smart as them. I need to be as successful as them. I need to go to this school like they go to. I need to act like they act. And you set up all these expectations. And then you fall. Yeah, right. It'll happen. It'll happen. So, depression is... That's just people out there in the world. Depression's not real. Depression's very real. One of the greatest preachers in the Bible, Elijah, was depressed. He was suicidal. He went and climbed under a juniper tree and said, God, just kill me. Because he didn't reach his expectations. You, newsflash, here it is, Channel 10 News. Here it is. You are going to fail. That's right. You're going to let yourself down. You're going to let your parents down. You're going to let your pastor down. You're going to let your Christian friends down. The key is... Don't stay down. There was this guy and he went fishing. And you know how they'll have these big piers coming out on the water? And they'll have the big pier and it had all these boards. And the boards were kind of like out here. They were rotten boards. And he saw this old man at the end. It was real high up. It was like a cliff. And the water was down below. And the guy's on the very end, real old man. And he's there fishing. And so he really wanted to go out there and catch some fish, and he saw the, the wood, and he's kind of making sure he steps on the right place. You know, it's kind of dangerous. And he gets out there to the end, and he says, Hey, old timer, have you caught any fish? And he says, No, not today. And he says, well, Let me ask you, you know, what bait should I use? And he was telling him some things about fishing. And as they were talking, he looked down how low it was, how far down it was, and he said, Man, if, if I was to fall down there, I'd probably drown, wouldn't I? And the old man said, yeah, if you stayed under. You're going to fall, but you don't have to stay under. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Maybe the reason you fail is because you didn't sacrifice your Isaac. And you're going in the wrong direction. Just a suggestion. Number two, this... Sacrifice in Isaac is an exercise of faith, not feeling. You see, this goes against all reason. It doesn't make sense that God would ask him to give his only son, Isaac. I mean, it, it, it's, it's ludicrous. It's against reason and it's also against reaction. It's against instinct. They have the augmented reality and now they're moving into virtual reality. You put on this thing... You can move, see your hands move around and they have all this stuff, cartoon looking stuff. And then they have, they'll have cliffs there and you're scared to even step out there because your brain is telling you that something's there that's not. And they have all this. You know, you have instincts God has put inside of you and those instincts, oftentimes because of Ishmael or oftentimes because of windows we left open, those instincts are used against ourselves. Abraham could have reasoned with Sarah. I guarantee you Sarah would have said, Abraham, you have lost your mind. You sure God told you that? That's not what everybody else is doing. How's Isaac going to go and get his career and be successful if we kill him? Can you step outside of your box just for a little bit? Can you step outside 
of those natural instincts for just a minute and say, Jesus, what is my Isaac? And am I willing to give this to you? Or does it have such a strong hold on you that you're keeping it for yourself? I'll go ahead. We're already, already jumped in, so here we go. This missionary was overseas and he was talking to one of the, uh, the heathen there, one of the pagans. And they were going back and forth and he was trying to witness to him. And the, the, the pagan, he was upset, obviously, and he took two pieces of paper. And he had one of these idols that they worshipped there and he had it there and he wrote on there, pagan God. Then he pulled out an American coin and he put it down there and he said, Christian God. Are you willing to sacrifice the Christian God? I could have went to four years of university. My older brother did. But I said, you know what? I'll wash cars and go to PBI. Amen. The armpit of the South. <laughs> I didn't never make any money. God took care of us. Amen. You know? Amen. So can't you do both? Oh, sure! You can just bring Ishmael and Isaac together. Have a little wedding for Isaac and Ishmael. Let them get married because Sodomites are doing that now. <laughs> no, it's an exercise of faith, not feeling. It goes against sometimes our natural man. You have to battle sentiments. You have to believe the Savior. You know, the Lord Jesus does not ask you to do anything that He's not willing to do. Amen. Jesus sacrificed for you. Yeah. He carried a cross Amen. for you. Amen. We sing the song, you probably do as well. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone. and There's a cross for me. You'll never get to that level in your Christian life until you're willing to lay Isaac on the altar. It's faith and it's worship. The Bible says by faith in Hebrews 11, Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Verse 5, you'll notice in Genesis 22, he tells them, he says, I and the lad will go yonder and worship. You just think you're worshiping God when you kick Ishmael out. It, kicking Ishmael out is just what you're supposed to do. You just think you're worshiping God by building a wall. Building the wall is for your own protection. You move to the area of worship and sacrifice where you can really praise His name when you can put Isaac on the altar. All the other stuff benefits yourself. This benefits Him. Because it shows that you're willing to obey Him no matter what anybody else says, no matter what your flesh says, no matter what you want to do. Obedience is the mark of Christian success. We're not Nicolaitans. We were talking about this earlier. I'm a pastor, but I'm no better than my church members. I'm no better than you. I'm trying to be obedient to what God has me doing. If God never calls some of you young men to preach, just be obedient in what God calls you to do. You ladies in here, be obedient what God calls you to do. Sacrifice for Him. Not for everybody else. Finally, I want, you to, I want to say this. Sacrifice in Isaac is complete surrender, not partial submission. There's no compromise here. It's complete surrender, not partial submission. There's no compromise. You remember Pharaoh and Moses. Brother Gene preached on Pharaoh and, and, and the type picture of us coming out of Egypt. And that was great. Amen. Before they came out of Egypt, Pharaoh tried to keep them in by compromise. And he came up with several different things. We won't go through all those. That's a whole other message. But he tried to use the compromise of conformity to the world. He tried to use the compromise of capital, of capital, of their money. He said, look, don't take your cows and stuff. Leave those behind. They said, no, we've got to sacrifice our cows too. They tried to use the, 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 the compromise of concern. Just send the men out there. It's, it's, it's too hard to, to tell the young people to serve Jesus. He said, no, we're going to go with our young, with our old, we're going with our cattle, we're going with all of it. No compromise. There's no middle ground between doing this thing with Isaac. It's not like, okay, you know, I'm going to halfway... How do you halfway kill somebody? <laughs> you can't halfway kill somebody. It's a sacrifice. 
So what does that take? It takes courage. Does courage mean that you don't have fear? No. Courage means nobody else knows you're afraid. But you step up there and do what you're supposed That's to do. Good. That's good. Nobody else might can tell it, but you're shaking in your boots and you go ahead and do it. Amen. Uh, Amen. In the military, you know how they'll do the physical exams to see if people can pass? There was this young man. He was kind of scrawny, you know. He was, uh, you know, a little bit scrawny on the, on the uh, peaked side. And, and he, you know malnourished. He was, just wasn't very healthy looking. Well, they, they checked him out and he was just kind of nervous about everything. You know, he, he had never done hardly anything in his life. I don't know why he was volunteering to be a soldier, but the, the guy asked him, he says, Doc, what about this soldier here? Is he, is he, is he missing any you know, vital organs? He says, yeah. He don't have any guts. <laughs> it takes some guts to sacrifice. Some courage. No compromise. The night before, Abraham is thinking probably. Can you imagine what's going through his head? God has told him to take his beloved Isaac. He loved him before he was ever born. God told him he was going to have a son. He started loving him right then. And he says, I want you to take him. And Abraham's thinking, it'd be a whole lot easier just to kill myself than it would be to kill him. Lord, can I sacrifice something else? Can I sacrifice an NIV? That'll be easy. Can I sacrifice Ishmael? I can kick him out and throw him down the hill and laugh at him. Lord says, no, I want Isaac. I want your dreams. I want your goals. I want your hopes. I want your future. Yes. I want your career. I want the love of your heart. The thing you love the most. Oh, that's good. Come on, come on. That's what I want. Nothing else. Yes. You'll notice that there's no canceling out. Verse number four, days go by. It's the third day. You see, what will happen is in between time, we're getting ready to be done with camp. You may be ready to sacrifice Isaac, but there's going to be a few more days before Sunday comes around. And then you know there's a few more days after Sunday. And so God will deal with you through the preaching of the Bible, and God will deal with you, and here comes a few days, and the devil will try to get in and say, hey, you can back out now. Maybe God changed His mind. Don't you feel the Lord leading you in another direction? I'll give you an insight on how Christian Bible believers get around God's will. We use the catchphrase, the Lord is leading me. Because what are you going to say to that? On these gray areas. And sometimes we hide behind that and we don't really know that it's God. Just be honest. We're living by faith. Sometimes living by faith, you're kind of like walking, okay Lord, uh, I'm living by faith and let's see what happens. Don't make everything so complicated. Just live by faith. God knows your heart. If you love Him and you live by faith and you make a mistake trying to do the right thing, He's not going to punish you for trying to do the right thing. Don't be so tight wound. Just live by faith and don't hide behind the Lord's leading me because you're not willing to sacrifice the thing you love the most. Amen. You've got to get past the peer pressure. God created you. You have your own fingerprints. God loved you enough to shed the most precious thing in the universe, the blood of Jesus, for you. Your self-worth and value is based on the blood of Jesus. You are somebody because of Jesus, not because of yourself. You don't have to have expectations because of the preacher, because of other Christians, because of whoever else. You follow Jesus. God puts other people in your life to help you, especially as a young person. But as you mature and as you grow, you have to develop your relationship with Him so you can hear His voice. Samuel thought Eli was calling, remember? Eli says, you got to quit listening to me. you got to start listening to God. Listen to the preachers as long as you're hearing God through the preachers. All the way back to the very first message. No canceling. You know, Hannah made a vow. Remember that? In 1 Samuel? 
She said, God, if you'll give me the child, I'll dedicate him to you. A few years go by, maybe up to four years. The devil said, oh, God, don't remember that. That was a long time ago. That was back at camp. It was hot. The bell's about to ring. You know, he really is not going to hold you to that sacrifice. There's no canceling. You say, Lord, here's my Isaac. Belief is something that you hold. Conviction is something that holds you. When God deals with you and God says, this is your Isaac, give it to me. No questions. No compromise. No convenience. It's not convenient. It's, it's always messy. It's always hard. It's always uphill. It's always a cross. John's on the island of Patmos. There's the, the Patmos before you have the revelation. There's Gethsemane before the resurrection. There's always the cross before the crown. What is your Isaac? Your future? Your family? Your career? Your plans? You know, Judas Iscariot was known by the world as one of Jesus' disciples. They saw Judas and they thought, man, that's one of Jesus' twelve. But he was also known in a little different light by the disciples. And even in a different light by the Lord. You have a public life. You have a professional life, which gets a little deeper into the people you work with, the kids you go to school. Then you have a personal life with your family and close friends. But then you have that private life that's you and God. And God says, hey, come up here on one of these mountains and give me Isaac. You say, the Lord really wanted Isaac. No, the Lord wanted Abraham. You say, what do you mean, preacher? You see, God was trying to find out if Abraham loved Isaac more than he loved God. And I'll share a story with you. My dad recently died last year. The greatest Christian man I've ever known. Led me to Christ when I was a little boy. A great witness for Christ. We used to go to blowouts together and revivals together and passed out tracts together and prayed together. He got saved the year I was born. I'm here because of my dad, because of his testimony. Some of you have the same testimonies. I know it's all God and glory goes to God. But God uses men and thank God they were willing. My dad loved Jesus Christ. He worked for 51 years civil service. He was in the military, then he worked at an Air Force base. He worked on these units that the pilot sees that uh, magnifies the, the pictures and so forth when the, the tank killers, the, uh, the A-10s, he worked on those units. And uh, for years, he worked 51 years. He always said, I work for Jesus and I go out to the base just to make a living. Yeah. He knew Jesus came first. That's right. My mom showed me a Valentine's card he had given to her years ago. And it said simply in this, in this thing, next to Jesus, next to Jesus, I love you most. Next to Jesus, I love you most. You see, Jesus was first. God was trying to see if Abraham really loved him more than he loved Isaac. That's why it says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and give him to me. You see, God was after Isaac. No, God was after Abraham. You see, what's, what's in between me and God? It might not be Ishmael. It might not be the discipline. It might not be the... the you might have plenty of walls. You might have a citadel. You might have a trunk wall. <laughs> you might have a trunk wall all around you. That might not be your problem. What may be between you and God may be your Isaac. And until you're willing to lay Him on the altar, you're never going to go any further in your Christian life. Corey Ten Boom, you know the story of her. She was the, the family of the people that housed and took care of Jews during the Holocaust, a Christian. 
she made this statement after all the suffering they went through. She said, I've learned to hold, I've learned not to hold anything too loosely. So when God says He wants them, they're easy to let go. Everything you have from your family to your brains to your future to your body, your soul, God gave you. It belongs to Him. If God says, I want your arm, here's my arm. If God says, I want your brain, here's my brain. If God says, I want your future, here's my future. Don't hold on to it too tight. It will separate you and God. And you will have Isaac in between you and God. I've got to finish. There was a beggar in India. And the prince came by and he pointed out this beggar. He said, hey, you there, come here. And he had nothing. He had a little cup of rice. His clothes all tattered. The prince says, what will you give the king today? The beggar's thinking, the king's got everything. What does he want? Why is he messing with me? Well, I have nothing. So he picked out three little pieces of rice, put them in the prince's hand. The prince reached down into his bag, pulled out three gold coins and handed it to him. Amen. The beggar thought, what would have happened if I'd have dumped out the whole bowl of rice? Amen. If I would have gave it all, what would have happened? That's good, brother. Amen. Don't live your life and at the end you look back and say, if I would have sacrificed Isaac way back there when I was a kid, what would have God done with my life? But now I've got all these things that are too important. And I've got car payments and house payments and I've got all these things where I can't find time for God now because I just had to fulfill my dreams. Why don't you just let God have Isaac?